All right, welcome everybody. Uh, I see a lot of uh, folks coming in, jumping in. You, you are uh, muted by default. Unfortunately, I forgot to change the settings, but that is not intentional. We really, uh, um, contrary to a lot of other events, we actually want you to engage and, and talk with us. So don't be afraid to unmute yourself and uh, engage in the conversation. I am Trevor Williams. I'm with Global Atlanta. We are a news service here in Atlanta that covers international business as it applies to Atlanta and Georgia. Uh, we're always looking for intersections between the city and the global economy. And we're so uh, happy and proud to be partnering with the Pendleton Group on this series of discussions called Reframing Resilience. And um, this, this session, we're looking at the impact of the arts on economic development and how um, some impactful organizations in our city are are uh, faring during this trying time. And uh, as we continue to let people in, I'm gonna turn it over right now to Guy Tesler from the Pendleton Group who will give us some ground rules for the discussion. And I'll, I'll continue to um, explain how we're gonna do this as well. I don't think today we're gonna do the, uh, the, four, you know, the one by one introductions that we've done in the past because we've got a lot of new faces. And if we do, we might take up most of our time <laughs> introducing ourselves. but. Uh, Guy will give us the ground rules and uh, we'll go from there. Guy? Okay, sure, thank you. And first, a few words about the uh, Pendleton Group, because I think there's two or three people uh, on the screen that are not familiar with, uh, with us. And there's a few uh, people from the group here. I see Steve, I see Craig, uh, Jorge, uh, so many pictures. If I'm missing anyone, forgive me. So the Pendleton Group is... Uh, uh, a team of business, government, and economic development professionals. And what we do is we help our clients tackle uh, the biggest challenges facing them. And that can come from uh, domestic and international economic development, uh, business growth and uh, business strategies, partnership developments to uh, uh, create this kind of uh, uh, community that uh, can talk and develop things together for the, the benefit of everyone, uh, public affairs, strategic planning, uh, and uh, site selection. And I won't uh, elaborate on that, but if there's questions, etc., you can reach out to uh, any of us or uh, meet us at uh, pendletonatlanta.com. Uh, about this conversation here, this is the seventh uh, program in the Reframing Resilience uh, 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 series. And the idea is to uh, kind of, uh, uh, Trevor, there's a bunch of people on the line if you can let them in. Um, sure. Um, so, so the idea is to uh, uh, create a conversation. Uh, we've all been to uh, hundreds of uh, webinars trying to uh, uh, teach us and educate us and uh, uh, tell us what uh, what is happening. But we all know we've been this uh, in this thing for eight months now. And the idea is to try to develop relationships as we were around the round table, uh, create uh, alliances, partnership, know which, what each, each one of us mm -hmm. is doing and collaborate in order yeah. to, first of all, survive yeah. what... Uh, what we're facing as far as uh, global challenges, yes. uh, but also come out better on the other awesome. end of it. So we want people to participate. Okay. That's why we ask everyone be on camera, uh, unmute your microphone unless there's some something uh, distracting happening there and uh, be part of the conversation. Uh, th this topic is a very exciting one. And uh, I guess the the evidence is that uh, this is our biggest uh, participation uh, uh, since we started the series, and I will hand it over to Trevor, our moderator. Uh, thank you, and uh, looking forward to an awesome uh, conversation. Hey, thanks, Guy. Yeah, this is, a, you know, we, we keep this invitation only because we want it to be a discussion. Uh, we don't want it to be a one-way conversation, or I guess one way would not be a conversation. We don't want to be pontificating about uh, what we know to, to, the, to the masses. We want to actually engage you. We do have what we're calling featured speakers because we don't want them to be uh, construed as panelists who are going to take up the entire time. Um, we, we genuinely want you to engage and, and um, hopefully the 
initial comments will spur some conversation and questions. And we're not we're not doing a Q&A at the end. We're not waiting to the end to ask questions. So if, if for some reason you have a question during the conversation, you can try to wave at me. I've got you in gallery view so I can see, uh, try to see as, as many people, as many faces as possible on my laptop screen here, which is not too big. But uh, also you could you can just type something into the chat uh, function and, and basically uh, raise your hand that way. Uh, and, or, and also or, not, or not, just, not, not just questions. If you have uh, opinions or comments or things like that, that can add to the conversation, that's fine. It's not just necessarily responding to what you've heard so far. Certainly, and um, yeah, bring up different things. Um, if you want to, you know, just flag something someone has said to say, hey, I want to talk more about that later. I want to in, an introduction after the fact. Please, please just let us know all those things because that that's really the idea of this. And I, I've been telling people, you know, since we've moved everything virtually, it's it's really my my opinion on it is that it's very easy to maintain relationships virtually. It's really hard to create them, and um, you know, so hopefully we'll we'll help facilitate. Uh, some creation of new relationships here that can um, be be you know uh, furthered after we get off uh, off the call and um, get back to quote unquote normal <laughs> if and when that happens. So uh, our, um, our 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 speakers today we've got Hala Modelmog who's the CEO, the new CEO of the Woodruff Arts Center. Uh, Hala, thanks for joining us. Absolutely, thank you. Great, and um, again, I'm not. I am going to uh, drop their bios into the chat so that y'all can y'all can actually just click on those, and that way uh, we don't have to spend time reading them. They've all got illustrious backgrounds that uh, <laughs> that would, would take up quite a bit of time to read through. But uh, we've also got Tomer Zvulun, who's the general and artistic director for the Atlanta Opera. Tomer, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Great. Uh, we have. Uh, Paula Fogarty, who is the interim executive director for the Savannah, for Savannah Jazz, I'm assuming the, the organization, but also the festival. That's right. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thanks. And we had Arturo. Oh, here's Arturo Jacobus. Hey, is it Jacobus? Jacobus, yes. Great. Thanks, Arturo. Uh, Arturo is the president and CEO of the Atlanta Ballet. Um, so lot, lots going on there. And again, I, I just dropped the uh, bios into the chat function so everyone should be able to see them. Um, Hala, maybe I'm, I'm a little biased because I know you better, but I wanted to start off with you. Uh, you've just gone, I, I think you're the you're probably the per perfect person to set the table for the conversation today because you've just gone from six years at the Metro Atlanta Chamber over to the Woodruff Arts Center. Um, why don't you give us a sense for what the, you know, the, the breadth of the Woodruff Arts Center, what it does, but also why that move really made sense for you. I think um, you know, it's not that you haven't been involved with the Woodruff Arts Center, you've been on uh, various boards and things like that, but um, I, I've noticed under your tenure at the Chamber, there was, there was quite a bit more focus on kind of the, the cultural life of the city versus just the traditional economic development um, approaches that have been taken in the past. So tell us about that. Uh, well, thanks, uh, Trevor, and hello to everyone. It's great to see uh, lots of old friends, and uh, hopefully, to your point, we'll make some new friends on this call. But, you know, uh, when Jorge called me about doing this, I have to say, I did think it was a good intersection for me, and I know that people like Craig Lesser and Jorge, and probably you can attest to this, during the time at the Metro Atlanta Chamber, whenever we were courting remotely a big uh, company who needed to hire people and were bringing people to the market, we always, always talked about the arts and culture, and we especially talked about the Woodruff Arts Center, and, um, and really just because it was shorthand for Atlanta, um, you know, uh, competes at a world-class level with art. And people, uh, you know, the old kind of saw that whether people ever, you know, dart the doors of your museum or go to your play or go to hear the opera, they like to know it's there. And mm -hmm. so it really, to, to me, it, it was always a part of our pitch. And we always involved uh, the CEO of the Woodruff Arts Center or Susan Booth, who runs the Alliance Theater, anybody who could talk up the arts. So... Uh, I do think it's uh, it's it's vitally important, and you know we had Tom Cunningham, the um, uh, our, the economist. I always I just call him this Tom, comma the economist, talking <laughs> about uh, 
about the economic value of all of these arts organizations and what it means to the state of Georgia. So uh, I am definitely uh, pro arts and pro economic development. And I will tell you just, just briefly in, in case uh, someone doesn't know, the Wood of Arts Center uh, were comprised of three groups, the High Museum, uh, which is open, time tickets, mask, the whole nine yards, but they've been having um, pretty good traffic and it's definitely picked up. The Alliance Theater and the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. And both of those have, uh, as you would imagine, have gone virtual in a big way. And it's, um, it's good that they could do that because musicians wanna play, actors wanna act, and it's important as I know all of the art uh, people on this call know to try to stay relevant and in the face of the consumer because someday we will be able to perform to large audiences again. And one thing I'll, I'll just offer up um, is that for some of the other art, arts organizations on the call, we do like to do partnerships and try to help out where we can. As a matter of fact, I was very familiar with Tomer's Tent and can't wait to hear a little bit more about that because, uh, and, and really it's, I'm not the one doing that work. It, it ends up being the leaders of each of the art partners, but um, thrilled to be here, love the topic and uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. I, I did, I, I wanna come back to you on, on some of this because I think uh, part of it, part of the shift that happened at the chamber and I think uh, that, that led you over is sort of a shift in the in the makeup of the economy of the metro area too and, and the types of people that are coming in. So I wanna talk more about that uh, in the future, but I, I guess this, you know, perfect segue, I wanna to get to Tomer's tent here. Um, Tomer, you know, with the, uh, the Atlanta Opera, tell us about uh, how you've shifted. I mean, we, we really, like Guy said, we wanna get past the 101, right? The, the COVID 101, which is that we all went virtual, right? We're looking at um, what, what were some of the solutions that y'all came up with to A, diversify revenue, B, get get in front of your, your audience, um, even in this time and, and tell us about the tent. Well, uh, first of all, again, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, the, the idea of the tent is based on a very simple uh, realization that we had early on uh, when COVID hit. Uh, and that is amidst all the disinformation, the infodemic that we had, one thing has always remained clear and that is outdoors is, is more safe than indoors. Mm -hmm. People may disagree about masks or not masks, vaccines or whatever, antigens, but outdoors is more safe than indoors. And so for that reason, early on in the pandemic, we decided to postpone a whole season, our 2120 uh, or 2021 season, and just move it a year. And instead of uh, piecemeal postponing things, just worry about that next year. And that freed us all to think about what would be uh, an opportunity to come up with a new business model and with the new uh, artistic product. And so then it occurred to us that there is something about circus performers that is very gritty. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of world war or depression or human Holocaust there was, the artists of the theater of the circus found a way to pitch their circus by the railroad station in the worst times in history. And there's something about that grit and perseverance that spoke to us. And so we created this idea of a tent uh, and the sides of the tent are open so that the walls are up and air is flowing in and out. Mm. Uh, and we chose two operas, two pieces that are relevant for our time and have a theme of the show must go on, which was a term that was invented in a circus. It was invented right. when the animals stampeded out and the ringmaster says, oh, show must go on. <laughs> and uh, once that idea was, was in place, we had to execute it because I, ideas without execution is hallucination. So the first thing to do was to engage a uh, team of epidemiologists led by Carlos Del Rio. I think everybody know the name and mm -hmm. uh, John Halpert from Grady Howard Pilevsky, who is on our board of directors and, and other folks that allowed us to write a small book, the size of Anna Karenina, 
uh, <laughs> that is all about protocols of safety. And then, uh, you know, those protocols of safety includes outdoors is more safe than indoors, audiences in pods that has social distancing of six feet away from each other. Audiences must have uh, masks at all times. Opera singers are either going to sing with masks or they're going to be behind vinyl towers that separate them from the audience and from each other, which requires a lot of coordination. And so that was the, the first step. And it was an incredible collaboration with Emory and uh, with uh, uh, Grady Hospital. And it allowed us to really connect with those institutions as well as with Oglethorpe University. Because uh, we this tent is mounted in a, a field of dreams, if you will, in in the baseball field in Oglethorpe University. Mm. So we uh, loaded in there in September 25th and opened our first show on October 22nd. We have two productions running parallel, parallel along with three more concerts so that it's 21 consecutive evenings of live performance safely. And I'm proud to say that after seven weeks, uh, we, have, uh, we have not encountered an outbreak. Uh, we are testing our artists uh, every week. Uh, we have about 100 people involved from the singers to the orchestra members. The orchestra is uh, playing in a separate tent uh, outside of the main tent, mm. uh, but everybody's separated. And, you know, uh, there are so many things you learn when you are performing outdoors. Opera is not meant to be performed outdoor. Opera is, right. is meant to be performed in a sterile, perfect uh, acoustics of a theater. So we have to deal with the rain and with the Marta train and with helicopters that seems to be um, uh, flying extra during performance time <laughs> with bugs, with humidity, you name it. Yeah. But, and then with hurricanes too, that's mm -hmm. a different story. B but there is something about this idea, this ethos of the show must go on that really grabbed the company and grabbed the artists and it grabbed the audience. So there's, Great ticket sales, great connection with the community. And here we are. I, I can, I'm also happy to tell you about some failures. Not everything works, but mm -hmm. I think that that's a part of discovery. That's a part of what we do. Yeah. yeah and I think two things that you just mentioned that, that stick out to me. One is that you already had some of the core relationships in place that helped you make the adaptation. And then, you know, you're, you're, you know, I wanted to bring out the question of, are you serving the core or are you serving new people? Or are you serving both? And how do you balance that? that those, those are themes I, want, I think I want to come back to, but just to keep it moving, I want to bring in uh, Paula, Paula right now. Um, so Paula, tell us about um, Savannah Jazz Festival, what, it, what it's like. And of course you did go virtual this year. How did it go? Yeah, well, thanks for having me again. Um, it, it went um, well beyond our wildest expectations. and. Um, Again, this was new territory for all of us. I'll just tell you a little bit about our organization since some of y'all might not be so familiar with us. We're a 39 year old nonprofit organization uh, founded uh, as Coastal Jazz Association. We have our festival is our, um, our, our primary initiative. We have monthly concerts and we have educational programs and we're launching a new exhibit in May on the history of jazz in Savannah at the Savannah. History Museum. So we've got a lot going on, but the festival is the big thing. And the festival really is um, an iconic Savannah event. And we're considered to be the most culturally diverse event because we're entirely free. That's part of our charter. Um, we also run the Savannah Jazz Orchestra. So we feature them a lot during the, um, during the festival. So in the last four years, we've grown our festival audience in person from 20,000 to 50,000 in 2019. So we were looking forward to, you know, a tremendous growth year in 2020 in person. Last year, our estimated economic impact to the city of Savannah was $1.3 million. And we were looking forward to growing that. We have a ton of corporate sponsors. I'm the beggar in chief because <laughs> we don't make any revenue off of ticket sales. And, you know, our, our philosophy is that we want, we want kids in Section 8 housing to mm -hmm. be able to enjoy world-class jazz, blues, zydeco, funk 
um, just as much as lords and ladies from London. And mm -hmm. so we have the coolest mix of people ever. And it's a week long free festival. And um, it, it really goes to the quality of life in our community. And we're able to measure heads and beds with our hotel partners and so mm -hmm. forth. So this year, uh, we got the biggest grant uh, ever from the city of Savannah uh, for $85,000. And so we had huge plans and big headline acts coming in from Germany, coming in from all over the world. And that stopped in March. And what do we do? What do we do? So we had an emergency board meeting and came up with a concept to pitch to the city. And the city really didn't know what to do either. So we put our heads together as a board and decided to do propose a hybrid sort of festival. You know, jazz music in particular is music that happens with an audience. You know, right. improvisation is a key ingredient to jazz. So to have jazz musicians playing to a brick wall is going to the, the quality of music and performance is going to suffer naturally. Mm. So we said, okay, let's find an outdoor venue that's also covered, which is a tall order in Savannah or anywhere really. Um, but we found a beautiful outdoor garden at Ships of the Sea Maritime Museum that the museum said immediately, yes, you can have the venue for free for however long you want it for the festival. I called WSAV network and um, my friends at Dick Broadcasting Radio Stations, they both jumped on board to be our live streaming partners without a doubt. Mm. And mm. So we were able to quickly collaborate with um, a w WSAV, who is a next, next star, formerly NBC affiliate, and uh, Dick radio stations throughout the Southeast and nationwide, and came up with a plan to present to the city. So we presented our alternative plan to the city, including our safety guidelines, which did not read like war and peace, like yours, Tomer, <laughs> but it, we, we developed um, our guidelines based on CDC, obviously, and the city. And we found that the, the Disney reopening guidelines were, were really helpful. A lot of mm. our museum partners here in Savannah kind of took bits and pieces from that, uh, from their roster and also the uh, event safety alliance reopening guidelines so we kind of mashed those together to come up with our own and had a studio audience each day of 20 people they were seated six feet apart with a six foot table in between each person so the optics on camera people could clearly see that we had social distancing was in effect. Dancing, of mm -hmm. course, we're the Dancing People's Festival. Um, <laughs> and so dancing was, took place, but with masks on. And the idea really was we wanted the optics to take out to the world to lift people's spirits. Um, our former right. mayor called this a mental health, uh, mental health festival. And uh, because nothing, nothing makes people feel better than great music and moves yeah. people in that special way um, that static arts just don't do. And mm -hmm. our board of directors called it the Come Hell or High Water Festival because we were going <laughs> to do this whether or not the city went ahead and, and gave us um, the, the funding. And so that was in May. And then we didn't hear back from the city until June. And they said, yes, 100 percent, um, the city council, the mayor, the city manager, the cultural affairs commissioners, everybody 100 percent on board. That was the good news. The bad news was we had eight weeks to do 10 months of planning. Uh, mm -hmm. The artists we brought in, we had a mandate that no artist could fly in. Otherwise, they'd have to quarantine for two weeks. Mm -hmm. So all of our we we were able to draw an A-list roster of artists from the region, and we had several. We had eighteen of them drove in from New Orleans, and that's a twelve-hour drive. They were so excited mm -hmm. about it; they didn't care. And <laughs> we had artists coming in from New York, and but I, I think it elevated the 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 level of performance and the quality of performers 
because we were in this particular venue and not outdoors, we had yeah. Emmett Cohen, for example, a great piano act that would not have translated to the band shell at Forsyth Park, for mm -hmm. instance. So we had 16 live acts over five days and it was live streamed worldwide and the metrics uh, in the end show 175,000 viewers worldwide in every continent except Antarctica. <laughs> so the city asked me how I could improve next year. I said Antarctica. We're gonna get Antarctica. <laughs> get those uh, the researchers down at the base stations to tune in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I mean, exactly. I think that brings up an interesting question. So it's like you know, it's branding versus you know the immediate revenue, right? Like, so how how are you you know taking um, this the city brand out to the world that may eventually increase revenue yeah. in general even further because you, you exactly. Have, Savannah is exactly. already well known around the world, but like, you know, how can you enhance that um, versus, you know, just uh, getting the revenue there that, that's already, uh, you know, coming in for uh, hotels and things like that. That's exactly the, right. That was part of our proposal to the city was that, hey, hang with us because the economic impact was going to be deferred, but the brand right. is going to increase exponentially. So we had mm -hmm. surveys, online surveys, and we had a pretty good sample size. And one of the questions was, uh, if you're live streaming this and you're not from the region, does this event inspire you to maybe visit Savannah when it's when when we're live again and in person? Ninety percent said yes. Wow. So yeah, so we've got that number in 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 hand. Um, yeah. So you know that economic impact is expected to greatly increase once we're able to gather safely in person again. And also we, we garnered a, a ton of new business collaborative partners at like WSAV. So when mm -hmm. we're live in Forsyth Park, uh, we, get, we put about 15,000 people a night in the park. We're also gonna be live streaming around the world to yeah. this same audience. So mm -hmm. we gained um, tens of thousands of new social media followers and uh, people who have brand awareness about um, our organization and about the city of Savannah. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. So I wanted to, before we get too far down the road, I want to bring in Arturo um, to talk about what's going on with the, uh, the Atlanta Ballet. I know you've got the, the drive-in, you're preparing for the drive-in Nutcracker. And I want you to tell us about that and uh, just uh, elaborate a bit about how you've adapted and what, what's worked for you all so far and um, maybe a few things that people don't know about what the ballet does because I know you have an educational arm as well. So um, tell, tell us a bit more about that, Arturo. Sure, well, thank you uh, for inviting me. I'm really thrilled to be here and share ideas with all of you. Um, Atlanta Ballet is uh, celebrating its 90th anniversary uh, this year um, in 2020. Um, and as such, we're, we are the oldest ballet company in the United States. And, and perhaps uh, we haven't found anything to counter this, uh, the oldest performing arts organization uh, in, in Georgia. Um, and as such, I, uh, I, as I said to my board oh, a couple weeks ago, uh, we've been around for 90 years through the depression and two world wars, a couple epidemics and pandemics and so forth. And, and uh, we're still here and uh, we're gonna be here uh, as hard as it is, it's, we're gonna be here after it's all over and we're gonna continue to grow and flourish. Um, we have, uh, as you alluded to, uh, our, our operation is, has three major pillars. One of course, and, and a reason for our existence is the performing company. Uh, it's a company of uh, 38 dancers. Um, we, uh, we're, we rank around number 10 uh, in terms of size in the United States right now. Uh, the school is the second pillar and uh, we have one of the largest uh, ballet schools in America. Um, and it, uh, it, it's a combination of what we call dance for all in other words, we, we do teach uh, hip hop and, 
and ballroom and, and you know, and, and uh, you name it, uh, we have adult classes and so forth. But right at the heart of it, at the core of it, is the uh, professional um, track. Uh, and the purpose of that is to train uh, professional dancers for our company and for other companies around the country. Uh, and third, uh, and, and not least, is our community engagement program. Uh, we have, for over 25 years, had a very, very um, uh, active um, and long-lasting uh, community engagement program. There are, uh, there are a couple organizations that we've partnered with for over, over 20 years, such as the uh, City of Refuge, uh, and we're continuing to expand. We, uh, uh, before the epidemic, we had partnered with uh, the... Um, uh, a lot of the uh, social service organizations that we hadn't been with before. And so we, we've really tried to increase that footprint of our community engagement. Um, likewise, we have three pillars, uh, strategic pillars that we operate under. And, and uh, oddly enough, uh, even with the uh, severe constraints uh, around audiences and, and, and uh, other factors in our operation, um, the, they, they continue to be, we believe, valid operational uh, strategies. Uh, hmm. In fact, we've really focused on a couple of them uh, more, uh, more heavily because of uh, the, the opportunity we had and, and out of necessity in, um, uh, during COVID. Uh, the three pillars are uh, balanced programming. Uh, we've, we've gone through, uh, we've had uh, oh, four, only four artistic directors in our, uh, in our 90 year history. And uh, we've gone from uh, our founder, uh, who was a pioneer, Dorothy Alexander, um, doing you know, a wide variety of uh, repertoire. Uh, uh, Bobby Barnett uh, really focused on the balancing repertoire. Uh, John McFall was uh, leaned more towards the modern. And uh, what we decided as an organization when we hired our fourth artistic director, Gennady Nyedigan, uh, it was that we needed to present continuously uh, high quality performances, but, but, uh, but really try to have something for everybody on every season. So we do the gamut of the classics, the neoclassics, uh, modern, and, 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 and a lot of new works. So that's kind of who we are. Um, Early on in the uh, in the um, COVID crisis, we um, we we took kind of a, a uh, egalitarian approach to our employees. Uh, we decided that we were going to try to keep everybody on payroll as long as we possibly could, and if there were uh, pay cuts or or furloughs, uh, it would be distributed equally among all of the employees from myself uh, down to the person at the front desk. Uh, and we've been able to maintain that uh, through this period. Um, we also, uh, unlike uh, Tomer, uh, took kind of an incremental approach to our uh, programming and our, and our, op our artistic operation. Uh, there was so much uncertainty out there and, and early on, no one knew really how long uh, the epidemic was gonna last. And we were right in the middle of a season uh, with uh, with our main money maker uh, Nutcracker kind of uh, looking at us uh, down the road only a couple months away, and uh, so we held on uh, with the idea that hey maybe we might be able to get back into the theater and perform, and we kind of uh, canceled uh, the season incrementally as as each month each quarter uh, became obviously uh, undoable uh, in a live yeah. theater setting. Uh, and of course, the last thing we held on to was Nutcracker. And uh, because uh, just to give you an idea, it, it, if Nutcracker accounts for anywhere between 20 and 25% of the gross revenue of every ballet company in, in the United States. And mm -hmm. so between the Nutcracker and the school, uh, we have, uh, we and other ballet companies around America have an advantage that other performing arts organizations don't necessarily have. Uh, there are two money-making operations. As everyone knows, everything else loses money. 
uh, in the performing arts, uh, and it has to be made uh, whole by uh, philanthropic, philanthropy, right. uh, philanthropic support. And so uh, we, uh, we just to give you an idea, we net it, we usually net each year any between a million and a million five on Nutcracker. And uh, as we started analyzing with re, uh, uh, distancing of audiences, even if we could get back into the theater, uh, we would have to undoubtedly, uh, you know, have half of the house uh, or, or even less uh, in order to accomplish distancing. And the numbers, no matter how we ran them, had us losing, instead of making money on Nutcracker, have it had us losing about a million dollars. And so uh, at a certain point, we just had to call it. And yeah. uh, we, we, we came up with the idea of uh, the drive-in Nutcracker. Uh, it was to be our, um, our inaugural, inaugural year uh, at CPAC with our Nutcracker. We left the Fox uh, uh, last year, and this was to be our, um, well, actually last December was to be our, um, this December was to be our uh, inaugural year at CPAC. And uh, so we, we thought it would be pretty cool if we could do the, uh, the uh, drive-in at CPAC. And so uh, we worked with them and we worked it all out. And without getting into all the details, uh, yeah. we're selling tickets. It's going very, very well. And uh, we're doing, I believe, uh, five nights uh, with the opportunity to add on if we have to. We can accommodate about 100 cars uh, for each show. Uh, we're charging per car because... Uh, to try to break it down per person and everything would have been a, a logistical uh, mess right. and, a, and, a, and a log jam at the gate and everything else. Yeah. And so we're selling tickets in advance and selling per car. And it's going very, very well. We're doing what we're showing is uh, essentially with some edits uh, to accommodate for uh, tempos uh, and, and, uh, and trying to get the best performances we can. But, but essentially, it's the uh, 2018 inaugural year at the Fox. We have a brand new Nutcracker, as most of you know, that we introduced uh, at the Fox in 2018. And so, um, and so that's, that's the show. Um, Sounds good. Well, yeah. I, I, we, um, Jorge was saying, I think, some, uh, wants to ask a question. Jorge, did you, uh, did you have something? I think it's for one of our other guests. Um, to try to get some cross cross talk going here. <laughs> I think you're muted, Jorge. Yeah, I am. Uh, thank you, Trevor. I, I know, Tammy, uh, that you have to leave soon. Uh, I think you're in the middle of recording. But uh, um, I, before we let you go, I need to put you on the spot. And the uh, uh, <laughs> question I, I like is you, you were on the leading edge of uh, economic development for the arts community in Georgia. Could you talk a little bit about your efforts in terms of your activist role in, in terms of the legislation and securing the, the incentives, if you will, for the, for the music uh, industry? Uh, and what are your thoughts on what has happened since then? I think you, you were the precursor even to the film industry, but could you talk a little bit about that? Because we, as you can see, we have a lot of people around uh, uh, this, this discussion from the theater to, to, to the, the big production, to the smaller community, uh, so, uh, so, such as the, uh, the, uh, the True Color Theater, Cup County and so forth. So your work has impacted uh, uh, throughout everyone uh, here. So before we let you go, do you mind commenting on that? Well, sure, um, and thank you, Jorge. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here today. I uh, appreciate you guys including me. Um, I think what you're talking about, um, there's a couple of things. Um, the work of Georgia Music Partners um, for the music tax incentive um, continues, um, just like uh, film uh, had three pieces of legislation to get it to its very wildly successful uh, point that it is now. Um, we are uh, going to be uh, continuing our work on that at Georgia Music Partners with the legislators. Um, Senator Jeff Mullis is a huge proponent of that. Um, if we can get the music tax incentive where it, where it works, because right now it's currently uh, refundable and not transferable, the refundable component to that um, applies to, um, uh, for instance, if you're a Georgia business, you can take a tax credit if you hit the threshold on 
the tax liability that you have in Georgia. That's not terribly friendly to companies outside coming in and using our resources. So, um, you know, there's lots of work. I'm happy to talk more about that as we move forward. Um, certainly could uh, use the support of every organization to um, have a, a better understanding of, of what that is, what you need, if there's things that we can incorporate in that as we continue to, to improve that. Um, but, you know, as far as economic development and what has happened, of course, during the pandemic, just like um, everyone on this call, it's affected, you know, all of our businesses, all of our organizations. And, um, you know, the, I'm, I'm really grateful for uh, Grant Wainscott and, and the chamber. Um, you know, they have, uh, he has been intentional about putting uh, different groups of people together who may not necessarily work together in the creative industries. And, and you know, I can tell you that I have personally um, been very intentional in um, trying to connect the dots. You know, for instance, you know, production companies that, you know, have, have uh, traditionally put on live events, connecting them with um, perhaps innovative uh, businesses such as um, AXR EXP, which is doing uh, rooftop concerts. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, various uh, innovative uh, digital platforms. So I think that it's incumbent upon all of us. Uh, you know, we're, this, this pandemic has made us stop in our tracks and it allows the opportunity for greater collaboration. And I think that we all get so focused and I know that we, you know, we were in our, in our uh, you know, with our blinders on just to survive and work hard and make our businesses and our organizations successful. But you know, there's such a wonderful opportunity here with all that we have to leverage the resources of different groups, different organizations, you know, between gaming, you know, I, I, I come from the music perspective, so music touches everything. So between mm -hmm. uh, video games to film, television, uh, the arts in general, um, and, uh, you know, so again, our work continues. I um, hope I answered your question there, but um, the Georgia Music Investment Act is the piece of legislation that we did um, pass uh, a couple of years ago. It needs some work and we'll be working on that. So would love uh, input, uh, discussion, communication about that. I did put my um, email address in the, um, in the chat. Um, so happy to, happy to talk more about that. Thank you, Tammy. And, and, and everyone here is touched by the work you do. And of course, from an economic development, I love the, what, what you talk about connecting the dots, because I've always been a, a firm believer about that. Because as economic developer, we know what to do from an economic development perspective, the traditional one, but connecting the dots to the arts and to the nonprofit. We got schools in here, uh, the other nonprofits that, that, uh, that, that, that work with the, with the uh, immigrant community and workforce development and so forth is great. But also you have another role because you project the image of Georgia all the way in, in your role as a vice chair of the Grammys. I mean, what, what, a, what a great way to carry the name from, the, from, a, from a marketing perspective. And, and, and then the work of the music that is producing Georgia through all these venues that we're here and how to all elevate it to the, at the Grammys, at the national level through the Grammys. Well, to your point, uh, it is connecting dots, but you know, my motto is build bridges and open doors. Absolutely. And, and you know, there another project that you may have heard about that I work on um, that does have four pillars that does intend to help, um, you know, aggregate those resources. Uh, the announcement came out a couple months ago about the Grammy Museum. Um, the intention of the museum, it's, it has four pillars. Um, first and foremost, education, music education, um, workforce development, economic development, and then celebration. So, you know, we, we talk about music being Georgia's greatest global creative export. And, you know, the world, the, the, the impact that music from Georgia and specifically Atlanta has on the world and on culture is more recognized outside our, our city and our state than it is internally. So, you know, mm -hmm. we always look for ways to um, leverage that, um, to have, like I said, uh, those, those conversations about how we can all work together, um, which is going to, you know, it's the rising tide and raises all the ships. So, yeah. um, you know, I could go on and on, but I won't, um, uh, again, uh, thank you for having me. And I would love to, you know, connect with anyone here on this, uh, about that further about our, you know, um, work at, with the sound diplomacy study that Fulton County just completed. Um, on the music uh, impact of music studios and rehearsal facilities in uh, Fulton County. 
Um, oh. So, you know, happy to have those conversations. I think Tammy, Virginia can, I, a can I ask you a quick question before you have to go? This is sure. Virginia Hefner. Thanks for all your work. Hi, Virginia. You, hi, nice to see you. Do see you, uh, you do you expect um, if the credit is is uh, amended, which I fully support, do you expect that would help increase post production in Georgia? Uh, it seems to me that that's one of the businesses we haven't really expanded enough, given the quality of our musicians around the state and. I understand that's an expertise, of particularly kinds of orchestras, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. On 100%, that. And, and thank you for bringing that up because mm -hmm. you know the, we've done a great job as a state bringing you know, film production here. Um, you know, we need the writing and we need the post uh, here in order to complete the full cycle holistically. So to answer your question, um, there is a component, a planned component of the Grammy Museum project. There's a, a carve out for a scoring mm -hmm. stage. You know, I am a mm -hmm. huge fan and avid supporter of our 27 time Grammy award winning symphony orchestra. Um, yeah. They <laughs> should, the orchestra should be recording the score for the next Marvel super film. So, um, mm -hmm. or feature film. Uh, you know, I believe Couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> we, we have um, 15 uh, 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 symphonies and orchestras around the state. Um, which is, you know, easily, you know, if you look at what Nashville is doing with gaming, um, doing those orchestral scores, um, also film scores. So yes, 100%, we believe that music could really be the Trojan horse to help drive that conversation because again, music is a part of all those productions. Um, yeah. So, and you're right, the expertise of, of post-production, some of that of course is already happening here at Tyler Perry Studios. Um, but, but we do believe that this could be the driver to really help, um, you know, sort of uh, be the tipping point uh, to bring post-production here as well. Right. Thank you. Sure. I think that, that may be a good, a good way to bring Halo back in here because, uh, you know, I, I was thinking of we got different layers going on. We've got the resiliency of the organizations themselves and how they've pivoted and, you know, tried to generate some revenue and, and some currency with their fans during this tough time. Um, but then we've got you know, the, the role of these organizations in the city's economic resiliency. And then, you know, then there's the branding level on top of that. So um, can you kind of dip back into your, uh, into your economic development uh, experience and talk about how that, that uh, conversation has shifted a bit in Atlanta, uh, considering the creative industry and how it's changed here? Yeah, definitely. And thank you for allowing me to jump back in because I was about to jump out of my seat when Tim <laughs> and we're talking because I mean, I couldn't agree more. And let me just say a couple of things before I get into your real question to try to bring this again back or bring it to economic development, because I know that's what the Pendleton Group is about. And I certainly appreciate that. Uh, but uh, let me just raise my hand right now and say that, um, you know, sign me up for any lobbying or anything we need to do for legislation around the music part. And the other thing I will say, and I might have to call you back up and say, please cut this part out, but <laughs> um, because it's a little bit premature. Uh, but between all the streaming that the symphony is doing, and they have episodes, if you get my drift, and potentially the plays that the Atlanta, excuse me, the Alliance Theater is streaming, guess who might like to be eligible for some film tax credits? Because mm -hmm. we're putting on these TV shows mm. and their episodes and they're produced in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, I, I can't say much an original more. work in original, original work, original work. And I can't right. say much more than to say that Lee Thomas and I have become closer friends over the last few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you know, fingers crossed on that. And again, it's it, it does take us right back to economic development. Lee Thomas, as you guys well know, is a part of the Georgia economic development uh, team at the state. And what has happened is just phenomenal. And I applaud Tammy as well. I wanted to, I'd sent her in privately in chat, congratulations on the, the Grammy Museum. And um, shame on me that she had to call out how many Grammys <laughs> the ASO has. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, seriously, back to really my, my first comments, it, it really is important to have 
you know, art in the community. And, and again, it's not just the Woodruff Art Center that is this, you know, big, again, world-class area that, you know, we do, we feel like we do three things, world-class art, education. I'd like to talk about that a little bit more in a different context, and then really around social justice. And there's been a lot of work done in that area that people probably don't know about. But to bring it back to the broader, broader, uh, topic of economic development, you've heard all these other tremendous arts organizations in this community talk about what they're doing. You've heard, Tammy, you've heard the legislation that we've had to try to get passed. And to your point about how things have shifted over, let's just even say the last, let's say eight years. Um, mm -hmm. when we were recruiting companies to come into town. We had to make sure that what we had available for those companies was not only the Wood of Art Center, but we had to be able to say things like Atlanta is the hip hop capital of the universe. And it is. And that was in Forbes magazine. And they were recruiting millennials. I mean, our first big push was get companies who need millennials with education. We've got them. Let's move more of them in here. And then before you could turn around, we had to start recruiting Gen Zs. So all of this, all of this music that we have that we're famous for, um, all of the other art, um, the other organization in towns, uh, Jorge mentioned True Colors. There's just so many wonderful things and it really does make a difference. And these companies, when they move here and they make a decision to move here, they've got to believe that they can hire the talent. And our creative side of this market really, really drives our talent, it dri drives the talent and the kind of talent we bring in drives the art. So there, it's, it's so entwined and I hope I'm not just stating mm -hmm. the obvious. And then I do have one other thing I wanna say about education because the other thing that companies wanna know when they're moving into a market is you know, how does the education rank? And we mm -hmm. know we have some issues uh, in some corners of, of, um, of some of our basic education, but you've heard now from uh, several art partners who do a lot in the education world. And we certainly do at the Woodruff Alliance. And in a normal year, we would spend north of $8 million on education for the educators and for the K through 12, and we touch, I want to say, almost every county in Georgia in trying to help education uh, through the arts with the children. And there's a big study out of Arkansas that says this kind of education through art and this kind of exposure to art increases not only your literacy, but your numeracy. So we know even small touches make a difference. So again, all of these things we're discussing couldn't be more related to economic development. Yeah, and I, I kind of wanted to bring in, uh, Tammy, do you want to say something? Just, just one last thing, uh, you know, to Hala's point. I mean, they all do touch. This is a bigger, greater story, and it's a story that needs to be told. You know, we talk about many times needing to be better storytellers. And, you know, we, we, we all promote our own individual, uh, you know, uh, sectors and, and, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if we could all, you know, rally together again and, and to the point of resilience and recovery um, to really look to be able to tell this story on a wider scale so that we do attract, you know, the business, we do attract the companies. And last thing I'll say is, um, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a um, huge uh, part of this Grammy Museum uh, as we move forward. So I'm happy to, you know, we can sidebar on that perhaps some other time, but I just did want to let you all know that again. Thank you so, so much for having me today. Well, yeah. um, Trevor, can I jump in and, sure, and sure. finish off part of what um, she, Tammy was saying? Um, it, is, it is so true that again, once again, Atlanta has an upper hand on the diversity and inclusion piece. And just as um, uh, Savannah's jazz uh, place was talking about, they were on every continent. One of the beautiful things that have happened out of going virtual is that I, I would say probably all of the arts organizations, we are touching people in 45 countries, um, 40, excuse me, 45 states, 11 countries. We're, we're reaching a lot of people. 
it's getting our story out there and it's also making them see what Atlanta looks like. And I, I really have to put in a, a big plug for the High Museum. Um, they have been working on um, in, in, uh, increasing their diversity inclusion for the last five years. And they are the most diverse museum in the country. And part of that started with some um, second Sundays where families came for free. We're on a MARTA line. People were invited to be a part of the museum. And the Alliance Theater has been working for a very long time. You know, Kenny Leon ran that uh, before. Now we have Susan Booth. And we have a lot of data around uh, playwrights and, and people that we're touching, and especially um, Black artists. And the ASO has a program called, they call the Talent Development Program, where they take um, Black and Brown students and uh, pair them with uh, musicians and have training. And the numbers mm -hmm. on Black and Brown um, symphony uh, or, uh, orchestra musicians is really, really low, like in the one to 3% range. So it, this is a good part of our story that needs to be told as well. And it's also a part of the story that sells from an economic development standpoint. A lot of these companies are looking for diverse talent. They can't find it in the place they're in and they know they can find it in Atlanta. Uh, I wanted to maybe bring in Ch Chandra Stevens Albright on that. Uh, did, did you want to say anything about what uh, True Colors is doing and how you fit into this conversation? I think, um, you know, one of, one of the questions I sort of had is, you know, how how well integrated into the, the machine of economic development do these arts organizations feel like they are? I, I think there's probably more room for connecting of dots, as Jorge mentioned, um, and getting people more involved in that conversation. Maybe I'm, I'm just ignorant of it, but um, you know, to, know, to know that fact that you, know, you are contributing to the recruitment of companies that are asking for a diverse workforce, I think is, is a strong statement that um, will kind of add some vitality um, to you know, the efforts to promote the arts. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll give a, a pass a shout out along to Josh Phillipson from um, from Alma from the Atlanta Regional Commission because that Alma program helps to bring all of us into the room together and helps to foster some of those relationships that make us part of this very powerful network. I've been in the background. I want to talk to this person. I want to talk to that person uh, <laughs> because you know typically there's a size description. I won't say segregation, but because it's kind of a loaded word. But you know the bigger organizations tend to work in a space, and the smaller organizations tend to work in a space. I don't see that in Atlanta. There's a great deal of of collaboration across large and small. Woodruff has been awesome. Um, so yeah, we're just trying to make sure our 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 mission is to celebrate the rich tradition of Black storytelling while bringing uh, giving voice to bold artists of all cultures. So while we tell black stories and we're centered on black stories, we want to tell those stories and lift voices of all cultures. So we're very much interested in being part of this conversation. Great. Thanks so much. And I know you had a, a question for Tomer about whether you could rent the tent or not. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking in terms of an earned income opportunity, since it's so tough to fill houses, um, and you know, there's there's those challenges. Is that an option? Would you be open to looking at an earned reven revenue income stream by making that available to other organizations? Yeah, of course. We're happy to talk. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, yeah, and and I wanted to bring in too. Guy was reminding me. I mean, there's an international element to this. Some of y'all have alluded to, you know, the idea that um, your your performances are being streamed and the and the you know the audiences are. Uh, everywhere except Antarctica, and <laughs> so I, I was wondering, um, maybe maybe from Tomer and Arturo's perspectives, I, th I think, uh, and maybe I'm generalizing here, but I, I would say that you know both of your outfits kind of uh, cater probably more toward an international audience, and you bring in a lot of international acts and artists as well. So. Um, wondering if y'all are plugged into the conversation about how the opera and the ballet fit into, um, you know, the conversation of bringing in uh, international investment. And then we've also got some some consuls general on the call as well from Belgium, and I think uh, at one point we had uh, the UK as well. But uh, maybe Michelle, I don't know if you wanted to discuss 
uh, some of that from the Belgian perspective, but maybe start off with Tamir. Sure, I think it's a really interesting conundrum right now because normally you're right, uh, opera and ballet are engaging uh, international cast, singers, et cetera, musicians, dancers. Uh, but what is happening with COVID right now is actually anti-global because you can't travel and they can't come here. And so what happened actually is really interesting because uh, we realized that there are there is a conglomeration of phenomenal superstar opera singers in Atlanta that normally sing in Paris, London, Madrid. Well, they're all stuck in Atlanta right now. <laughs> they can't go anywhere. So what we've done is we created this uh, group of company of players that are based on Georgia singers who are now full-time employees of the company and they are featured in our productions because they can go nowhere. So that is just an interesting, ironic development. But uh, what, what we are doing is uh, by, by kind of creating a path for safe live performances uh, is piquing the interest of companies in Europe and other parts of the world uh, in, in, in that kind of protocols that we created that I mentioned, mm. the Tolstoy book that we wrote. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, we were invited uh, recently by uh, Opera Europa, which is the uh, parent organization of all opera companies in Europe to present in Europe uh, some of the protocols that we created here. So the keynote speakers for that conference include three companies, uh, Venice, Madrid, and Atlanta. So there's an interesting um, opportunity here and you never mm -hmm. waste a crisis, right? So right. You know, we're making lemonade out of this lemons and hopefully in the future, we'll be able to get back to a place of engaging again, international opera singers. But right now we're investing in local because uh, global is not always open right now. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Arturo, did, did you have a, something to add to that? And, and I forgot to mention, we also have Honorary Consul General of Hungary, John Parkerson on the call, who's helped organize all this too. And I wanna get John in here too, if we can, but Arturo, maybe, um, again, I'm curious, is, is, the, is the ballet part of the team when it comes to recruiting international, international companies or helping executives you know, feel like they have a, a cultural landscape they can get behind here? Uh, yes. Uh, well, Atlanta Ballet is an international company. Um, we have uh, uh, resident dancers uh, on our full-time payroll, uh, of whom probably 30% of the company are from another company, uh, country. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, so getting visas and, and that sort of thing is a big, big piece of our uh, uh, um, background work. Uh, and so, and, and all of them are um, uh, stuck here. Uh, many of them, you know, go back home for vacation and everything. And, and they're, uh, they're here, well, because it is uh, essentially the season, even though it's a virtual and drive-in season. Uh, we, we are an international uh, company, uh, no question about it. I think there's, I don't know, 12 or 13 uh, countries represented uh, in our uh, company of, of um, 34, 36 dancers. Um, the big input uh, internationally uh, for us is uh, choreographers and designers. Uh, uh, the design team from, uh, for our new Nutcracker was essentially uh, from, um, from Great Britain. Um, we have uh, choreographers from South America, Europe, uh, all over the world that we bring in each year. We do many new works, uh, bring those choreo choreographers in from around the world to create the works. And, uh, and then of course, the even existing works that we either repeat or uh, uh, acquire from another company, um, those uh, require someone from another country usually to, to come in and set the work on us. All of that, of course, as Tomer uh, indicated, uh, is the case for opera, uh, uh, that, that's come to a halt. And so uh, I, I neglected to mention in my kind of overview uh, earlier that uh, we, we have a, uh, we've canceled now the spring season, of course, and we've come up with a, uh, a combination of virtual uh, early uh, live streaming from the uh, Rialto Theater 
uh, in February and March. And, uh, and then we're hoping to do outdoor uh, in uh, April and May. And uh, so that's kind of our season for the spring. But hmm. we've, uh, because we can't uh, get uh, international people to come in and, and set new ballets on us and so forth, um, we're, we're creating all new works for this virtual and outdoor season uh, in the spring. And uh, we're calling the whole se uh, spring season Silver Linings. And the reference there is that uh, Gennady uh, is facing this quandary of what do we do for new, you know, all the old works are, um, any work at our repertoire requires uh, contact. Uh, that's the nature of dance. And mm -hmm. uh, so we had to create a whole new repertory for the spring that is virtually solos. Um, and, uh, and some contact with uh, uh, married couples and, and, and uh, dancers that are living together and so forth. But uh, so it had to be unique work to this strange and, and uh, wonderful uh, year that we're in. And yeah. uh, so uh, Gennady uh, put an invitation out to the dancers to say, hey, would any of you like to uh, try on your choreographic voice uh, and, and give it a shot. And mm. uh, about nine dancers stepped up and said, you know, I've always, I've dabbled in choreography and I've, I've always wanted to do it. And, and this is a great opportunity. And so we have, uh, we're gonna have eight or nine new works uh, by uh, our dancers, um, uh, created by our dancers in this, uh, in this spring season that we're presenting. And so uh, Gennady said, well, you know, if there's any silver lining in this COVID thing, uh, it's that we are able to give this opportunity to these young dancers who may, you know, actually find um, uh, a, a choreographic voice and go on and, and excel at it. Um, oh. And of course, we did announce uh, oh, a few months ago our new uh, choreographer in residence, uh, Claudia Schreier. She's a New York based uh, choreographer that did a, a new work for us a couple of years ago, and she's now our resident choreographer. And she will be flying down from New York, working, uh, of course, with all the protocols in the studio for distancing right. and creating a new work uh, for that, uh, that season that is a season of, you know, solos and, and, and very careful uh, <laughs> duets and that sort of thing. Great. Well, I, want, I, want, I do want to bring in our, our diplomats too, but I think Craig uh, Lesser might have had a question from Pendleton. Yeah, question kind of comment, a little bit of both. Yeah, sure. First of all, you know, we've looked at the economic development impact of our cultural organizations from the work they do themselves, the employment they, they encourage themselves. We've looked at it um, probably not enough from what Hala uh, and others have talked about in terms of, of the association with education and workforce. Um, but I wanted to add one <coughs> comments here. One is, uh, and this is really a burden, not for the cultural organizations, because you all are doing such a phenomenal job, but it's really more of a burden on the economic development organizations. And I have to compliment Hela and Jorge for the work they did to reintroduce or reinvigorate in the economic development community that the cultural aspect of what we are, who we are is so important in attracting new business. And that is particularly important in my experience in the global recruitment um, and all of you have traveled globally, all, uh, virtually, I'm sure. Uh, and, you know, my experience in traveling to 43 countries, whether it was for the state or for business or even on my own, but primarily in the, in the previous two, the notion is at some point during your business meetings, during your, your work with your colleagues in other countries, there's always a point where your host will say, Tonight, we will go to the opera, or, to, or this afternoon, we will visit an art museum, or some other element of culture, because it is mm -hmm. so important to our global partners, because it is who we are. It lasts a lot longer than individual policy. And I dare say, until very recently, and again, I compliment Jorge and Hela for reintroducing this notion uh, when they were at the Metro Atlanta Chamber, the idea that you know, global investors are interested in a government-to-government -government relationship, which we have 
pretty well done. They're interested in the business relationship, which is ultimately the job creation. They're interested in the educational component, but they're also interested in the cultural piece. And we in the economic development community don't do as good a job as we should in encouraging early on in the process of recruitment, bringing the cultural aspect in. And again, the Metro Atlanta Chamber has done a, a brilliant job of that, but the burden is on the economic development professionals to take advantage of all this extraordinary work that all of you in the arts are doing and building your organizations and spreading the, the great culture throughout our state. The second piece of this that I would just like to mention is in most countries around the world and historically in all of civilization, the support for culture has come very strongly from government. And we don't have enough of that support from our government, particularly our state government. And we collectively, I think, can do a better job of trying to work that. There are individual pieces. Somebody uh, mentioned Jeff Mullis earlier at the state and the state legislature. And there are great pockets of people who are really strong supporters, but we don't have that kind of routine encouragement for the arts from our state government that I think is very, very important for us to keep building that economic development component. Yeah. These, I, you know, all of these components are also venues for personal relationships to, to blossom. You know, when you're done with the, with the, uh, the formal meeting, uh, you really have to have a place to build that relationship. And they can also be backdrops for, uh, you know, for the formal meetings themselves, right? Um, that, that give a, a bit of differentiation to your community, I think. But Hela, I think you wanted to interject something? Yeah, and it's really just putting, uh, just adding on to what um, uh, was said. And I really do appreciate those words, Craig. But here's just to put a finer point on the amount of money the arts doesn't get in the state. We are 49th out of 50 states in terms of support for the arts. And it just really shouldn't be that way. We, we're a fabulous state. We've got a world-class city here. So I, I would just encourage all of us to be on that bandwagon. And then the other thing, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting because I had not heard it put exactly that way that, that um, Craig put it. Uh, I'm a little bit behind him. I've only been to 36 countries, but absolutely, when you're in someone else's country, they want to show you their culture. They want to go to a museum. They want to go to um, some kind of performance. And you want to go because you're wanting to soak it up. I don't think we do enough of that, but we have had quite a few dinners it, at the Wood Park Center, at the High Museum specifically, for, you know, at the end of the day, you've taken them around in the Georgia Power helicopter, you've talked to the business, you've talked to the state, you've done everything, and then we will just bring them, I say we, now I'm on the other side, you guys will just bring them in to the High Museum atrium, and we can turn it into magic. And we can even have you know small performances. And one of the things that I did do from time to time, and I really encourage this, and this can happen even during COVID, is just to give someone a behind the scenes tour, so to speak, of the museum and have Rand Sulpik, who is the lead person there, be the docent for them. I mean, there are ways to impress people. And I totally agree with Craig. Let's just take advantage of it and we'll make it as easy as we can on the economic development people. They've got a lot of pressure on them, a lot to try to show. But you know, that in that evening when people are, you know, finally tired, they can finally sit down. You usually just go to a restaurant and, and goodness knows I'm all about promoting our restaurants right now. Uh, that's another part of my career is the restaurant business and they need it. But Sometimes if you want to have a little bit of a special dinner and also where you can hear each other, um, you know, think about coming to one of the arts organizations or, you know, going, take advantage of uh, Tomer's Tent. I mean, I just think that's a great point. I just wanted to hammer home a little bit. Yeah, and I think we've got one question. Is it, is it Evige? 
Jean-Francois, uh, you're muted. I think you'd have to. Yes, you said that perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Uh, this question is for any uh, of the panelists or anyone who um, wants to chime in. You know, when it comes to the pandemic, I, my view of it has kind of been like the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, <laughs> the bad being the pandemic itself. And, um, or rather, I think that's probably the ugly and, and the bad, obviously, the venues that are shuttered and people not being able to connect. Uh, but there have been some bright spots, the virtual concerts that we saw in the spring, people singing on balconies in Italy and Barcelona. And um, here, uh, we may remember that viral uh, a party that DJ Nice had, Michelle Obama and Oprah uh, uh, participated. And so in terms of uh, the remarkable efforts that you're making across the industry here, what is the future? What is it about this time that you would like to see remain with us? Is it the kind mm -hmm. of new music that will be created um, or, or just some of this innovation? What do you hope stays with us when we are behind this pandemic? I'm, I'm happy to go uh, to, to answer. Um, and I want to start with a, just a little story that inspired all of us during this time. And that's a story of a, a violin, a very famous violin player, uh, Itzhak Perlman. Uh, and in 1995, Perlman was performing in Lincoln Center in every Fisher Hall. And uh, he got on stage playing a major symphony where he was featured. And the very first thing that happened is that his string, one of his four strings popped and he couldn't help but notice, I mean, it was a huge pop. He was left with three strings. He couldn't play, he couldn't replace the fourth string. He just had three strings and he had to perform during that time. And he started playing and modulating and playing down and up the octave, recomposing the whole thing. And it was incredible. The audience just burst into applause. It was an amazing evening. And at the end of it, he said to the audience, you know, sometimes it is the artist's task to find how much music you can still make with what you have left. How much music can you still make with what you have left? Mm -hmm. So what do we have left? That's the question. And how much music, how much theater, how much arts can we do with it? And it's been amazing to see the innovation from driving Nutcracker to singing telegrams to shows in a garage, in a parking garage in Detroit to the big tent. And I think that a lot of those innovations created new art forms for a new generation. And some of, our, of them will stay with us. They taught us a lot about the vulnerability of our, of our organizations. And moving forward, we're gonna take those lessons, apply them and move forward with great energy. That's all we can do. Wow, that was very well, well, well put. put and uh, has me excited for the future. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> do you mind, so do you mind if two, I step in here? Well, I've got two, two and then I'll go to you, Lee. Okay, Sorry. go ahead. We've got, um, Tina Lilly from the Georgia Council of the, of the Arts wants to step in, and then we're going to go to Michel Gereptoff of, of the, uh, the Belgian Council General here, and then we'll go to Lee. So Tina, Michel, Lee. Uh, Tina, go ahead. Hi, I think that uh, was a wonderful question. And in um, looking at what arts organizations are doing across the state, I think that what I would like to see remain after COVID is the um, what COVID has done is forced everyone to rethink everything uh, from the core of what is theater, what is dance, uh, what is art, and everything that they took for granted. Oh, we do things in this space, or we do things with these people. They've, they've had to think about, and as creative of, as artists and arts organizations are, uh, as wonderfully creative as they are, sometimes they get stuck um, in a mold just like any other person or any other business. And so I would certainly um, hope that the uh, pandemic goes away quickly and doesn't come back. 
but I really, really appreciate um, what it's forced people to do and how it's forced them to rethink everything. Definitely, yeah, there's so much innovation in models themselves, not just the performance or the business or whatever, like the model that you build around your business can be the innovation, which is- Right, uh, right. Um, Michelle, what do you wanna say? Yeah, good afternoon to you. Uh, first, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with what Craig Lesser has said about the importance of art in economic development and also the role of uh, government. I think Belgium must be number one or two in terms of uh, the fraction of GDP, public money going to support art. And it doesn't come in the way of private money going into art as well. And it brings, it brings art globally very, very close to the people. And I want to turn the theme uh, a bit on its head, maybe resilience. We're, we've been talking about how the art world is resilient. But in Belgium, we also uh, used art to uh, increase the resilience of the society. We, we had some uh, terrible terrorist attacks a while back. And one of the way in which we reacted is that um, a number of big name companies in contemporary dance, in, in theater, in music, in film, relocated to some of the worst, let's say, worst districts of uh, Brussels, the the the, the places that your president has called L hole at some point, et cetera. And they moved there and they really started to work with local, uh, with the local youth and the local people, not only bringing them for free to, to the representations, to the shows, but also really giving them carte blanche, for instance. What would you do if you, if you could invite people? And, and, and there has been such a hybridation and now actually some of our most promising artists, some of our most promising scenarists and dancers and choreographers and etc. They come from they come from those places and they were nowhere five years ago. They really were born out of this and it has mm. really brought so much pride as well in those districts now. Uh, and and I, I think it's it's really something quite uh, quite fantastic. Uh, for the rest, COVID um, so art is everywhere really in Brussels uh, and, and because there is public money, it enables it to be also very accessible. Most of it is free, it's everywhere in the street and it was already before COVID and so it's carrying on. So we have concerts in, in graveyards, which might be taken as a bit of uh, black humor. Uh, we keep people on the move. Uh, so we, we have a lot happening outside and we have had um, operas, for instance, itinerary opera. So people, we keep people moving and we keep everybody moving so that as, so as to, to have also less risks of, uh, of COVID. La Monnaie, uh, which is one of our most famous opera, uh, has um, done in, in one month time a specific show for uh, COVID time, which in that case, it was without public, but they turned the opera uh, fully around and they shot it uh, live. Uh, in real time in the whole opera, not only in on stage anymore, but it, they took over the whole building and, and they shot it live. And they, were, they had lots of people following this and paying for that. So, because the difficulty is always monetizing. And my last point is uh, we need to keep also this artistic ecosystem alive. And so first we recognize all artists as being um, essential workers. So they can travel, mm -hmm. they can travel to and from Belgium. And also we had this specific PPP scheme for artists so that they, I mean, they don't have to sell their violin to, to eat. Yep. Wow, amazing. Lee? Yes, hi, I'm Lee. I'm the director of the Rialto downtown in Atlanta. Um, it's been extraordinary for us because as you know, we do 10 to 15 shows a year with, you know, dance, international artists and jazz. And we shut down on May, on March 7th, but um, as a presenting organization, we really had to ask ourselves, you know, what was our role within this situation? Um, so since then, we created programs like Homegrown for a distribution system for local artists, our Feed Your Senses for sort of higher level, more established artists. And then we were uh, people, uh, this is sort of answering uh, Edvizu's question, um, which was, we were approached by many artists who said that they wanted to have a presence um, in the United States, but they couldn't afford streaming. They couldn't afford a venue, they couldn't afford streaming. So I'm just so happy that we were able to step forward to provide services to people like Russell Gunn with his Royal Crunk Jazz Orchestra or, or even to Arturo at the Atlanta Ballet going forward. So I think that's the biggest thing you asked what we learned. That's what I've learned because since April with all of this streaming, we've had almost 50,000 people look at what we're doing online. 
And um, that was an absolute shock to me because it wasn't something that occurred prior to that in any big way. So I would imagine that we'll continue that effort because I think it's so extraordinarily helpful and it expanded um, our demographics and interests from all different walks of life. So I'm very thrilled with that. And I think that'll stay and live. Yeah, we've got uh, two other consular representatives here, Sean Watwood, who works with the Israeli consulate. I think you wanted to say something. And then I want to ask John, you know, John, you, I think you have your honorary consulship thanks to blues. So I want you to talk about um, what you're hearing from Hungary or when, when prospects come in, what, what do they think? You know, how, how do you kind of engage them in the cultural life of the city? But Sean, go ahead. Absolutely. So first, I wanted to say thank you guys for hosting this It's a great opportunity to kind of like, you know, kind of bring thought leaders together and just best practices share what's going on. Also, uh, Michelle didn't bring this up, but uh, he was instrumental in bringing to part nine consulates got together and we did a graffiti mural in the city was a part of Elevate with the city of Atlanta. We helped fund four different artists with doing the mock-ups. We paid the artists to do it. And so we actually put money toward the arts community. And that was something uh, that the ministry gave us a specific directive of like, now is the time or arts matter. And so you, we've been able to help with drive-ins throughout our region. We've done, you know, virtual dance festivals. So one of the positives of this is we've been able to redefine what art actually is. We, you know, cooking shows, uh, talking about, you know, professional cycling, all of these things became art and culture that most people did not segment them out. Also, we've been able to work with other consul generals, other countries and other you know, art forms to really bring communities together and build out those relationships. So um, I think the key takeaway is the ability to pivot and be flexible on where you're going next. Um, but thank you guys for hosting this. And I'm really proud of Tomer and what they're doing with the tent. Uh, so well done on that. Yeah, and so I want to go to John, and then maybe, I don't know, Phil Jacobs, do you want to say something um, to kind of close this out, you know, from the Pendleton perspective, and also you've got your, your, your hands and feet into different arts and economic development organizations, so maybe uh, since we're trying to, to close out at 1230, maybe Phil wants to have the last word, but yeah, let's go uh, to John, John first, uh, sorry, Phil, let's go to okay. John first, and then we'll, we'll have Phil close this out so we can get back to our days, but of course, y'all y'all have seen we have extent why we extended the time frame here because we have such uh, good discussion going on so john i'll give the short short version uh trevor you've all you've heard the long version so i <laughs> don't have time for that but um i'm the honorary consul general of hungary and uh, you know the the connections the relationships between countries that the arts promote is is, is a key part of what honorary consuls do. And I know the, the uh, career consuls do as well. Uh, mine goes back to, I'm an Atlanta native uh, and that, that presents for honorary consuls some advantage. We know where the sights and sounds and where to take visitors from the countries that we represent. Uh, in Hungary, the, the focus often in culture is on music and it's um, often in, on film where great cinematographers and Academy Award uh, directors have come from Hungary, such as uh, Michael Curtiz, who, who directed Casablanca, and there are many others. Um, I think Grant Wainscott was on here, uh, who was on here, met Vilmo Sigmund uh, from Hungary, who won Academy Awards as a cinematographer for Deliverance here in Georgia, and Deer Hunter. So that's, that's one tradition, but let me move to your question more directly, blues. Uh, was key in my appointment as uh, uh, honorary consul of Hungary because I'm not Hungary, uh, not Hungarian ethnically, and I'm one of the few honorary consuls that don't have that kind of connection to the country. Uh, I've become an adopted Hungarian over time, <laughs> I love the culture, and I, I love the country and people of, of Hungary. But several years ago, I was working with Georgia Department of Economic Development then the Metro Atlanta Chamber and some other chambers of commerce in the area to host a trade mission, first trade mission from Hungary to Atlanta. And it just happened that the uh, ambassador of the Embassy of Hungary helped us organize this mission, identifying Hungarian businesses and governmental uh, people who might want to come to Atlanta and see what we're all about in the Southeast. Um, the ambassador came, brought his entourage from the embassy. We, had, we hosted about 20 Hungarians and then there were about 10 of us in our party. 
Grant Wayne, Wayne Scott was among that group at the time. Um, it just on the final night before, after three days of a successful trade mission visit, you know, typical program meeting business folks, the ambassador of Hungary came around to me and said, John, this has all been very great. Um, people uh, in Atlanta are friendly. It looks like a good business environment. It's pretty, lots of trees, you know, the things you hear all the time. He said, but he said in a hushed voice, he said, what do people here do at night? And I thought, oh no. At that time, I was working in the law department at Delta Airlines. And I thought, well, you know, when I have visiting men primarily from, from another country come to Atlanta and they ask that question, we don't know where that's going to go. And uh, it, there was, a, I was a little bit hesitant to, to respond. I said, well, what do you like, Mr. Ambassador? Here's the short, the end of the story. And he said, well, this is the South. We Hungarians love music. And he said, my, my special love is for, for the blues. And I said, really? Hungarians, blues? And he says, yeah, this, is, this being the South, there must be some place we can go hear some live blues music. Um, well, on the spot, uh, we put together the 10 of us from Atlanta and the 20 Hungarians, a caravan headed to a place in Virginia Highlands called Blind Willies. It was an off night. We sort of took over the place. There was a blues band that was pretty good named the Breeze Kings playing. And um, ambassador after a few beers leaned over to me and he said, I'm as good as those guys. And I said, no, 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 Hungarians, Hungarians don't play blues. You don't know blues. It's just the beer talking. Uh, another, another one goes by. I'm, I could play with those guys. I'm as good as that guitarist. So it was a bit of a challenge to me being a, a local Atlantan um, and also a blues lover. So um, I asked the band during their first break if uh, I said, see those people out there that don't blend? That's a bunch of Hungarians. And the little guy's the ambassador. He's <laughs> He says he's as good as your guitarist, and would you go along with a little joke and invite him to come up and play a song? I said, don't worry, he won't do it. He's an ambassador. Hungarians don't play blues. He probably doesn't even know how to play a guitar. The rest of this story, to make it short, is uh, they invited him. He accepted the invitation. He sat in with the band the rest of the night. It was very good, and uh, that's how my relationship <laughs> began. Yeah. Outside of outside of that trade mission with the uh, country of Hungary, well, I think that's so important. The the intangibles, right? The, yeah. And um, John, I remember that rooftop at the chamber that we that we did on your on your inauguration when, when we you. crown you. Uh, yes, the, uh, <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks. All right, the rooftop. We we the Fox Fox Theater was hosting the next night a concert of Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones. Mm -hmm. Bela is a Hungarian name. Bela Fleck's not Hungarian, but his parents. <laughs> musicians who love Bela Bartók, the famous Hungarian composer. And uh, it just happened that the ambassador learned that Bela Fleck was going to be in town. He invited him to our reception on the rooftop of the chamber, and he came and played the music that night. Wow, awesome. Well, and I, again, these intersections are show how you know these things are intertwined, like Halo was mentioning, and even the the Czech ambassador is coming soon, and and I've I've heard that he's a big jazz fan, so I might uh, we're we're trying to help help them find some jazz players to welcome him at his reception. So these things keep going on. But uh, Phil, did you want to close us out? We're getting a little, a little past uh, twelve thirty here. I thought you. Yeah, I don't. I I won't take much time. I just want to echo the thought that. Uh, the arts are economic development. My, my interest in the arts, not that I don't love the symphony and I go to the theater and I visit the high, but my original involvement in the arts was because it's so critical to economic development for our state. And we are very fortunate, the city, to have so many world-class arts organizations um, that, that we can attract people to. And I just think it's an underutilized asset and one we all need to to really figure out a way to become far more aggressive in making it part of the economic development package that we offer to, to not only the people who are already here, but to the people who are coming to visit and, and especially the businesses who are looking um, to, to come here. So thank you right. for doing this. I think it's a great step and I hope we can continue with this momentum.
Thank you. And I, I think uh, the organizers here, Guy and, and Jorge, will be reaching out to you all about how to get each other connected because there's been a lot of requests in that regard. Um, you know, so assuming that everybody's okay with that, I think they might share some contact information, but um, I will let them hammer that out with y'all uh, via email afterward. But thank you so much for joining with us and hopefully we'll see y'all at, at a subsequent event. Uh, but if not, this was a, a great discussion and we look forward to continuing it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.